only thing I want in life is to be known for loving Christ, to build His church, to love His bride, and make His name known far and wide. For this cause I live, for this cause.
is to be known for loving Christ, to build his church, to love his bride, and make his name known far and wide. For this cause I live, for this cause I die.
have this morning. We really good crowd this morning. It's good to see you. Amen. Now we just ask it. If you will, it's a good crowd. We're not only here this morning, but night and Wednesday night, get your house to be filled. Uh, when we have the services, Lord, we just ask for a good message and attentive ears, Lord, so we can share your gospel message with whoever we encounter. In your precious holy name, amen. 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 322, 322, stand up, stand up for Jesus. 322, stand up for Jesus. Sunday. 
So don't forget about that. Some of you are going to show up early anyway, so maybe I'll buy some donuts and we'll have something early going on. There's usually a few that trickle in a little early, uh, but uh, next week's time change Sunday. But we'll be here. Uh, amen. And then next week is election week. Yes. And I hope that you're praying. I'm telling you, as it's getting closer, I'm getting more excited than I really am. Uh, man, this is an exciting time. What a wonderful country that we can go vote. Amen. amen. Isn't that amazing? I mean, there's people that would die. Remember when Iraq fell and they had their first elections? I mean, the, 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 the proudest moment of their life was when they had that purple dye on their finger, which proved that they voted. And, uh, man, that was so cool. And uh, we, we got to force people to go out. We got to go pick them out. We got to go take them out. Have to, you know, a lot of evangelicals, 20% they say we evangelicals, and we're not evangelical, but we know what they're talking about. As the world sees Christians, 20% of them don't even vote. And I, I think it's a, a wonderful privilege that we have, and I hope that you'll exercise it. And if you're confused about who to vote for, I'm available after the service. Amen. And, uh, I'm pretty sure you can straighten it out right here. Uh, I'm not saying I find one or the other in the Bible, but human nature is human nature. Truth and light and dark are very apparent uh, between the, uh, where we're headed. And let me remind you, there's a whole lot more to worry about than just presidency. Right. And you've got judges, you've got uh, local leaders, you've got, of course, tax levies. Uh, you've got all kinds of stuff on there that you need to be aware of. Uh, right. We get more impacted by our local and state leaders than we do by the federal leaders. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but there's more notoriety, more attention on the national leaders. But don't, don't uh, I put a sheet back there that it just got, came in from Faith and uh, Faith and Family Coalition, I think it is, or Focus Coalition, but that's uh, just the, uh, the presidential candidates. There's all kinds of tools out there now. Uh, you can go to the Board of Elections website and look at your ballot that you're going to vote for and do the research. You know, if you're like me before, you go in and you're like, who are these people, right? right. But now you can ahead of time, go ahead of time and you can, you can research it and see uh, who, you, who you do want to vote for. You know, we are accountable for who we vote for. Right. And, uh, I don't want to ever be guilty of putting somebody in that's going to butcher babies. I just don't want to do it. And I, I, over the years I have, I know I have, because I just didn't know any better. But uh, that, that's a high mark. There's a lot of other marks. I'm not a one-issue one voter, but uh, some issues are way more important than other issues. And uh, I hope you get involved in that. Of course, it's too late to register now uh, for that. But uh, if you are registered, make sure you get out and vote. If you're not, Make sure you get registered for the next election, which probably means spring sometime. Um, but be a part of it, man. What a, what a wonderful exercise in our constitutional privileges. And, uh, and boy, it's just a wonderful thing. So I want to encourage you to get involved. So that's next week. Certainly we need to be praying uh, for peace in our nation. There's a group of people in our country that uh, want to create chaos. They don't want uh, the elections to go forth. They will do anything uh, to try and stop people from voting. Um, but you know what, God, oh, I believe we're on God's side. I believe we're on the right side of the arguments. And so, uh, you know, we, our trust is in the Lord. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. And the Bible says the horse is prepared for the day of battle. The safety is of the Lord. Yes. And so our trust is, uh, is in the Lord. We just sang a song, Stand Up for Jesus. Yeah. And it said, let courage rise with danger. That's right. We've lived very comfortably. Thank God for it. Amen. Right. Yeah. Not so comfortable right now, so let courage rise with danger. Um, you want liberty, you've got to exercise courage to, to, to keep it going. And, uh, and I hope you'll stand with me uh, in doing that as we do this in this community. <laughs> this community needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are here because we are here for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and that is the truth. And so we pro proclaim the truth in many different facets um, because Jesus is not just put in a box on this one issue. All truth belongs to God. Amen. When you do a math problem and it comes out 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's God. That's absolutism. Amen. Because God is an absolute God. I'm the, I'm the Lord. I change not. Well, so therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Amen. Thank God he doesn't change his mercy and his grace. Praise and God. flip it over. We all would be done and over with today. So God is a good God, he's a gracious God, he's a loving God, and he's a truthful God, he's a just God, and he is worthy of all of our praise and adoration. And I hope you know him this morning, his name is Jesus, and he'll save your soul.
and I hope you I hope you know them. If you're here without them, we'd love to share them with you in, in more intimate details today. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer for uh, this offering. Father, we thank you for this time to be here, and the Lord, I thank you for this great country in which we live in, Lord. I love that my children get to see us and live in a country where freedom is cherished and freedom is exercised. It doesn't mean it's without uh, a stumbling or without uh, uncomfortableness. Uh, but Lord, nothing uh, without a struggle is really worth anything. And so, Lord, thank you for the struggles. Thank you for the trials. Thank you for the difficulties. Thank you for waking up a bunch of us who were just kind of going through life and, and just enjoying the blessings without seeing all the sacrifice that was given so we could enjoy those blessings today. And give us that renewed heart that we would also have the same devotion for our, our, our heavenly country that we seek after. So, Lord, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for the people in this room today. Thank you for every soul, Lord. You are fully aware of every soul in this room. You know them. You know them intimately. You know their thoughts. You know their actions. You know their words. You know their deeds. And uh, Lord, you, you want to deal with them today uh, in that manner. And so I pray we'll open our hearts and our minds up. And for somebody here who's not saved, Lord, may they get saved today before it's eternally too late. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give. We ask that you'll bless this offering, bless the offertory. And bless this church now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
thinking about the Lord. Makes you humble, doesn't it? My Jesus, I love thee. Boy, it's a humbling song, isn't it? Especially uh, when you grow in the Lord, you feel like you can't love Him enough. And you feel like you don't love Him enough. And it compels you to keep wanting more of His love. Because the world cannot give you what God's love gives. You cannot even understand God's love until you receive the love of the truth. That's Jesus Christ. The Bible says, but as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is a spiritual birth that we're talking about. We're going to talk about Jesus today. We're going to Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 4. And as we have uh, done our study so far up to this point, uh, we are studying about the life of Christ and as revealed to us uh, by the account given by Matthew. Now, I hope you understand with the gospel accounts, uh, there's many that have attempted and, and have done a great job, I believe, um, and I've gleaned on a lot of their research. And done. There's a great harmony of the gospels that's done. Um, but you know, you can't harmonize everything in the gospel. We always have to remember that God has given distinct information and revelation to these individuals of what he wants written down in those books. Right. I hope you've settled the issue in your life that this book is God's book. Amen. Don't, don't think it's like any other book, because other books are all faulty and, and, and they, they'll fail you in some areas. There are good books out there, don't get me wrong. There's some real good things out there. But there's no perfect books except for this one. And actually, this isn't one. This is 66 different books. And they're all perfect. And they all go together. And there's one common theme all throughout the entire Bible. It's a, they call it the scarlet thread. And it's Jesus Christ and His kingdom. That's what the whole Bible's about. Oh, I'm glad it's about a whole bunch of other things too, amen. Because we lean on it, and we look to it, and we get rebuked by it, and we get encouraged by it, and we get edified by it, and we get taught by it, and, and we get corrected by it. And it's a wonderful book, and I hope you spend lots of time with it. And uh, by the way, if you don't have one, if you don't have one of those books, we'd love to give you one. we got a whole bunch of them here. Uh, I just, I ordered, I, I, I'm anticipating God is getting ready to do something great with our church. Amen? I hope you're anticipating. You say, why, preacher? Because I ordered 21 of, uh, 24 Bibles because we were running low, and I got uh, 40 of them in. So I thought, okay, somebody made a mistake here. Uh, by the way, we did call the Bible company and paid for the extra because I wasn't going to have that on my conscience. So we did pay for the extra. There was a shipping problem, and they sent some extra, and they didn't want us to miss out. So actually, at 45, we have 45 new Bibles. Uh, and we'd love to give you one. If you don't have one, sincerely, we want we believe we want to get a Bible in every home. We think that would be awesome to see. Uh, and there was a time where most homes had a Bible. Uh, now, many homes probably still have a Bible, but they're probably on the shelf with the rest of the books now. Uh, and we need to bring it back to the preeminence that it should have. And that's in our homes. And, and it should be uh, displayed and where people know. They may walk in and they can see all kinds of placards and things on the wall. But boy, they see that Bible, they know you're serious. And you ought to have that Bible out when you have people over uh, that come by. And maybe unexpected, oh, what's that? It's a Bible. Creates a great opportunity for witnessing opportunities. Just having your Bible out there. That's the power of this book. Amen. That's why they tried to burn it. They tried to get rid of it. That's why, uh, 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 I think it was Voltaire, I can't remember the guy, I think Voltaire or somebody, uh, oh, said, we're going to get that Bible in so many years, it isn't even going to be around anymore. Right. And the first printing press ever made was Gutenberg's printing press, right where they said where he lived and said, what's going to happen? Yeah. And, uh, well, God's got a great sense of humor, doesn't he? Oh, man, you guys don't, obviously. But no, uh, no, listen, I'm kidding. Listen, I know it wasn't funny. But I was thinking this morning, think about this. Psalm chapter 2 says this, right? And we're going to, I feel like rabbit trailing a little bit, so I hope you bear with me. The Bible says, the, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a main thing? Because the kings of the earth and the rulers of this world, they set themselves against the Lord and against his anointing. All the chaos that's going on, it's against God. That's what it's always been, it's against God. But you know what the Bible says? He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Do you realize in Ephesians 2, you and I are already seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus? We get all ruffled about what's going on. God's up there laughing about all this chaos. He's like, look at these guys. They don't even understand what they're doing. They think they have truth, and they don't. Now, this isn't specific to America. This is all over the world. 
They think they're going to defeat me. Well, Goliath thought he was going to de defeat me. He didn't stand a chance. I got a little, a little teenage boy that's going to take him down. That's all it took to take Goliath down. Right. Little teenage boy. All the men were cowering. All the men were putting themselves out. They didn't want to go down and fight Goliath. So some little young ruddy boy comes along and says, Who's this guy? We got God on our side? What's this going on? I'll tell you, church, I've never been more encouraged uh, as we're getting closer to our election in our country. God is on our side. I'm telling you, I, 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 I'm not a prophet. I'm not standing here prophesying anything. I'm just telling you, man, God is working. God is moving. I hope you're on the right side. Because Moses had to draw a line in the sand and say, who's on the Lord's side? Amen. And uh, you better make your choice because uh, it, it has never been in my life as clear right now for us uh, uh, where, what direction God wants our country to go in. Mm -hmm. And remember, it's our country. Yeah, right. It's not Biden's country. It's not Trump's country. It's our country. We the people. Right. Remember that? Amen. Uh, maybe the, we the people need to get courageous. We the people need to stand up and start voting biblical values right. and get back to the Bible. The problem is most of us aren't living them in our homes, so it's tough to vote for people because we feel bad. We feel like hypocrites. So stop being a hypocrite. Start doing the right thing. And you start seeing people the right way. So anyway, I don't know, we'll get to Matthew 4 here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know what? It's on people's hearts. Isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I've already talked to men. Where are we talking about? Different things that are going on. The debates and stuff. That's where people's hearts and minds are. Yes. So when your minds will hit it, strike it while the metal's hot. And say, listen, I, I remember in 2008, I think it was 2008, we had somebody in our church, and I preached the message right before the Sunday before election, standing for religious liberty before the uh, before the election, because we knew election was that week. And I preached it, man. I preached it from the Bible. And I said, man, this is what the Lord says. He's for life. Right. He's not for death. Right. He is for life. And somebody came up afterwards and said, you know what? We were going to vote for President Obama at the time, but we didn't realize he is an abortionist. Or he, he's for abortion. He's for... If you don't know what that is, the dismembering of babies in the womb. Mm -hmm. Sounds so moral, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds so, like, we're, we're so much better than everybody else because we, you know, we, we, we are concerned about the woman's health. How about being concerned about the baby's health? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, um, so anyway, uh, it's, it's where people's minds and hearts are, so we've got to talk about it. And you say, well, we're at church, yep, and that's where the American Revolution was won. Mm -hmm. We're the churches of America. That's where it was. When you had preachers that back then they wore robes, and uh, at the end of a service they would peel their robe off, and their underneath it was their uniform, and they'd say, "All right, let's go do our business now. Let's go fight for America." And we're there. I hope you're ready to fight for America. Amen. Right now we can do it with a boat. They did it with a with a gun, so we could do it with a with a pen right. or with a with an electronic box. That's what they did that for. And if we lose that privilege, then we're going to have to do it again with a gun. We're going to have to do it again if God allows us to. Right. See, we got to do it God's way. They did it God's way. We're reaping the blessings. We don't do it God's way. God's hands are off. And, uh, but guess what? Great peace of they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Amen. Shouldn't matter who wins the election to live for Jesus. Amen. Just because it might get a little darker. If you live for Jesus, your light will be a lot brighter. Amen. Amen? And that's a biblical principle, by the way. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to talk about the beginning of Jesus' ministry now. His public ministry. Uh, you remember we talked about the uh, baptism of Christ uh, through John the Baptism. Not John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And then he had his baptism. And then he right away went off into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days of the devil. And of course we spent some time last week on how to conquer the devil. Uh, that temptation when it comes along. We talked about a little bit of different types of temptation the Bible talks about. But the antidote is always the same. It's the Word of God. <clears throat> and the Word of God is quick. And it is powerful. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it does pierce to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Yeah. That's its purpose. That's what it does. And so it is the answer. Well, John the Baptist, now we find here in verse 12, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Understand here, John's ministry is over. It's done. Not because he did anything wrong, but because he had fulfilled his purpose. 
He had done what was asked of him to do. Uh, he had accomplished what he had been sent to do. And now it was his time to kind of go off the scene. And, uh, and, and then Jesus says, all right, my time to take up the torch and continue on what John the Baptist had begun. Now, um, we see here it says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast <clears throat> into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulon and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Nephthalim by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Amen. For uh, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, wasn't that John's message? Yes. He said, Bring forth fruit, uh, meat uh, for repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He picks up the mantle, picks up the torch, and says, All right, it's my turn now. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. This is the beginning of the earthly ministry public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to study about that today and some things that were evident in his ministry. And I think if we, if we see it the right way, we're going to see our ministry. We're going to see what God's entrusted to us and the effect of what a proper ministry will do. It's amazing to me. He goes out and preaches, gets a couple men together, and they got multitudes. Praise the Lord for that church growth. Amen. I'm like thinking, man, he goes, I'm going up to Capernaum, I'm going to plant a church, and boom, look at this. And boy, the Lord was working. That's the same Lord today that will work in this church. And will work in our lives, individually and collectively, to do the ministry. So we're going to talk about that today, about his ministry, and try to make some application this morning. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this time that we have together to study your word. And Lord, as there's been many words said and many words sung already this morning, uh, there weren't any greater or of more importance than the words that were just read from this book. For it is your word that is what we need this morning. It is your word that is like a hammer, the Bible says. And it breaks down the stony heart that we have as human beings. So Lord, if there's some that are prideful in this place today, would you, would you take the hammer of your word and humble them this morning that they might once again walk in fellowship with you. For the brethren that are, and sisters that are hurting and going through some difficult time, Lord, would you take your word and comfort them and counsel them today and reassure them today. Under the words that you did over 300 times, fear not. Fear not. So Lord, help them. Help us this morning, Lord. If there's someone here lost, may they get saved. If there's someone here back, so let bring them back, Lord. If someone here seeking greater uh, of your will, Lord, compel them to come and commit themselves and dedicate themselves to your work this morning. Whatever it is, Lord, we leave it in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So let's talk about the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. We'll go through it, and then we'll see if we can make some application. The first thing I want to talk about in his ministry so we understand, the uh, first of all, the move 
to Capernaum. Now remember, he was with John the Baptist in the wilderness, and uh, he was actually in Nazareth. Now we know he was in Nazareth, that's where he lived. Um, but why did he leave Nazareth? Why did he leave there and go to Capernaum? I mean, that was his hometown, that was where he grew up. Remember, he uh, one of the prophecies fulfilled that he came out of Egypt and, and went into, he would be called a Nazarene, and so that was one of his fulfilled prophecies. So, I mean, why in the world would he leave his hometown? I mean, most people feel most comfortable where they grew up. They feel it's kind of their hometown. I, I grew up not too far from here in Eastlake. I'm telling you, you go back out there in Eastlake, and it's like you never left. I mean, you feel comfortable. You, like, you, your mind goes back to just a, uh, wow, this is where I'm, I'm at, and there's a comfort. So why in the world would Jesus leave Nazareth, and why would he go up to Capernaum? Well, put a mark here, because we're going to be looking at some other scripture. We'll come back to Matthew 4. But I want you to go over to uh, Luke chapter 4 with me. Luke chapter 4. And I, I think this is a great uh, reminder uh, what we learn here about ministry. Uh, Luke chapter 4 and uh, verse number 16 says this. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, Heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, Unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving name in the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They wonder the world he teaching. Well, they knew what he was teaching. What they were saying was basically, hey, prove yourself, Jesus. Prove yourself who you are. Physician, heal yourself. Remember on the cross, one of the thieves said, Hey, if you be the Son of God, get us down off this cross, and then we'll believe. You know, our faith isn't what we see. It's in what we read, what we know from the Lord, what we can't see. That's right. And so they didn't have any faith. In fact, they were kept looking at, at Jesus as Joseph's son. Do you know that every time that Joseph was brought up to Jesus... He, uh, when it was says, you know, when Joseph was called Jesus' father, he always deterred and said, he's not my father, in, in a roundabout sense. He'd say, no, no, my father's in heaven. Joseph was not the earthly father of Jesus. It was a spiritual birth. It was a miraculous birth. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. His father was in heaven. It was not an earthly father. Thank God for Joseph, though. Joseph did what he was supposed to do, and he raised Jesus the way he was supposed to raise Jesus. We don't know a lot about Joseph, but we know that he did what he was supposed to do, and he raised Jesus. Thank God for Joseph. But Jesus said, that is not my father. But all they could see was the earthly man, Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's why he couldn't do anything miraculous or marvelous in Nazareth. Because they could never get past, oh, this is just Jesus. We used to play ball with Jesus. <laughs> hey, we used to run around. We used to play tag with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Even his own family. 
way, because you know, Joseph and Mary, the Bible tells us, had a normal marital relationship after Jesus was born. Mm -hmm. They had more children. Jesus had uh, brothers and sisters, right? And they didn't even believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. They lived so close to Jesus, they said, you can't be the son of God. We know who you are. Now, mind you, Jesus was perfect. Right. You, you, we can't even conceive a perfect five-year-old. We can't even conceive it. We can't even conceive a perfect 15-year-old. I mean, my goodness, you know, ooh, that's a miracle in and of itself. Right. But that's what Jesus was. Yeah. And his family looked at him and said, oh, no, 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 no. That's just my brother, Jesus. Oh, that's just Joseph's boy. They couldn't see him as God in the flesh. Right. You know, you can't be saved unless you see Jesus as God in the flesh. <laughs> that's what the Christ is. That's what Messiah is. That's what say it, it, it's it's Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh, Amen. and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. So the people of Nazareth rejected Jesus. He couldn't do anything there. Wait, it goes on. Uh, but none of them, let's see, uh, the lepers, oh, verse 29, and rose up, now watch this, and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill, whereunto their city was built. Why? That they might cast him down headlong. Um, I think they said your welcome is your welcome mat is removed, Jesus. <laughs> mm -hmm. You get a picture of taking Jesus by the scruff of the neck and his robe and running him out to the side of the hill where the city was built and said, You're going over, Jesus. We don't want to hear this. And you are a false prophet. That's what they were accusing him of. That's why they were going to kill him. Because they didn't agree with his interpretation of the scriptures. You know, there's other people in our world that kill people. Because you don't agree with the interpretation of their scriptures. Yeah. Christians don't do that. Amen. We don't run people over to the hill, throw them off a building because they don't agree with our scriptures. We pray for them. Yeah. We pray for them that they get saved. We pray for them that they would repent. Because we know vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Yeah. You know, some of us yeah. maybe use that as a, our life verse. Vengeance is mine. No, finish the verse. Say it, the Lord, right? right. You better be careful. He, he was rejected by the people of Nazareth. He was going to be killed by the people of Nazareth. His people said, get out of here, Jesus. So he went. He left, and he went over to Capernaum, which in the long run didn't turn out much better. But at least they didn't try to kill him in Capernaum. So his move to Capernaum was because of the imprisonment of John the Baptist, because of the rejection of the people of Nazareth. But then there, if you go back to our text, there is one other reason why he was not in Laz uh, uh, Nazareth, but why he went to Capernaum. And we find it here in verse 14, that it might be fulfilled. Remember, Matthew is writing this book showing prophecy after prophecy after prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilling these prophecies because it does, it is written to the Jew in the sense that Jesus is the king that they're looking for. This is the seed of David. This is the seed of Abraham. This is the son of God. Uh, this was the one born in Bethlehem. This is the one that caused all the women in Ramah to weep because of Herod's killing. This was the one that came out of Egypt and went into Nazareth. And this was the one, uh, now that we see, this is the one, the Bible says, that Isaiah prophesied. By the way, it's in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And it says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee, the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is spread out. That was a prophecy Isaiah was given by God in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse number 1 and 2. So why did he go there? That he might fulfill the scripture. Amen. That he might fulfill the scripture. The greatest proof about God, proven scripture. Proven prophecy is true. 100% accuracy on the prophecies. Praise the Lord for that. So in the beginning of his public ministry, he moves to Capernaum. Now secondly, um, about his public ministry, there's a message to continue. We've already talked a little bit about this. There's a message to continue. 
We find in verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, the one thing that the Jews never had a problem with, generally speaking, was believing in God. Mm -hmm. was, you don't have to convince a Jew to believe in God. They believe in God. Uh, the devils believe in God. We know that, too. <laughs> Amen. I mean, anytime they're talking, they're always talking about God. And Jesus is God. Uh, the Son of God. Those things. Those titles. But, uh, so here we have just the word repent. We, we see a parallel. If you hold your place there and go over to Mark, chapter number 1. Go to Mark chapter number 1. You'll see a parallel uh, that's in verse number 14. Mark 1, 14 says this. Now after that, John was put in prison. So we know it's about the same, it's the same parallel. Jesus came into Galilee. We already read that. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He's about to tell you what the gospel of the kingdom of God is. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, Mark's writing is more of Jesus uh, as a servant. So it's not specific to the Jew. And so it, it's a lot more uh, general in its writing. And that's why the word believes in there. Because there are a lot of Gentiles that are reading the book of Mark as well, uh, the book of Mark. And, and they need to know to believe the gospel, right? So there's an added point to it. Repent and believe. They all go hand in hand. If you're repenting, you're believing something new. You know, if you're repenting, we went over this, I think Wednesday night a little bit. Repentance is nothing more than acknowledging the truth. That's a Bible definition. 2 Timothy 2.25. Repentance is the acknowledging of the truth. Now, what does it mean to acknowledge? I'm not talking about a, a mental assent to a biblical truth. I'm talking about an egg. When you acknowledge something, you give a written remittance, an acknowledgement, right? There's an action behind it. So, so when I agree with God that I am a sinner, that I do deserve to go to hell, just like everybody else, and I don't want to go there, and there's a way out named Jesus, and I believe the gospel that it is Jesus the way out, then I get saved. But until I acknowledge the truth that I am as bad of a sinner that deserves to go to hell, I can't get saved. I mean, I'm telling you right now, that's where... The, the conversation stops with many people. Generally speaking, it's not hard to get somebody to say, yeah, I'm a sinner. Uh, I've shared this many times. Have you ever done any soul winning? You know, I, use the, I, I go through the law. I go through the Ten Commandments. I do some other things wherever God leads me. But oftentimes, I'll, I'll try to get it to the law because the law is the schoolmaster to bring people to Christ. So why is God's law there? Well, well you just start going down the list and you say, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness. That's lying. Okay, that's being a hypocrite, being a liar. So, have you ever told any lies? And most people are like, yeah, okay. I, I, yes, but how many lies do you think you've told in your life? And, and who knows? I mean, if somebody comes out and says one, they're lying again, right? So, we know it from our own experience, it's a multitude. No, and most people say, well, who knows how many, right? And then you say, well, what does that make you? You'd be amazed at how many people say, a sinner. Mm -hmm. If somebody told you a lie, Brother Aaron tells me a lie, I would say, you sinner, you. You better believe I'm going to say, you're a liar. You know, because I know it cuts a little bit more when I call him a liar than rather a sinner. Mm -hmm. Right? So we have to look in the mirror. We have to say, I'm a liar. Well, I'm not a liar. Well, that's your pride rearing up right now. All right. You've got to come to that point. You can go down all the Ten Commandments. You broke them all over and over and over and over again. Lord, no. and, uh, and, and God didn't give them to us so we could just keep them. He gave them to us to show us we need a Savior. We need help. We need redemption. We need forgiveness. And thankfully, through the blood of Jesus Christ, He offers forgiveness to all those who will repent and believe the Gospel. What's the Gospel? The death according to the Scriptures. The burial and the resurrection of Christ according to the Scriptures. That He did that, that we might have forgiveness and, uh, and cleansing through that. It's the same message. You know, today there's such an argument, it's amazing. I don't go in Christian bookstores that often. If you go, you're a glutton for punishment. That's fine. There's so much garbage on there. I mean, it is bad. It, isn't it amazing? I, before the one closed out in North Homestead, I don't remember which one it was, you, it got to the point where the King James Bible was a special order Bible. 
You could go in there and buy everything else, but you couldn't buy a King James Bible. You had to order a special Bible if you wanted a King James Bible. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that the Bible, the Word of God, you couldn't buy in the Christian bookstore, but you could buy everything else that talked about it? Yeah. And books about repentance are a dime a dozen right now. Yeah. And, and, and there's so much dissecting of this and dissecting of this. Why don't we just believe what the Bible says? Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Right. By the way, it's the central message that Enoch preached. You know, the seventh from Adam? He preached about repentance. He talked about the ungodly who commit their ungodly deeds and God's coming for judgment. You better get right with God. You had Noah standing there, a preacher of righteousness. What's he preaching? Repent. Jonah goes into Nineveh. Repent. You have uh, Josiah, the king, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Nahum, Amos, Jonah, Hosea, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, and all the other Old Testament prophets. Repent. You come to the New Testament, you start right off with John the Baptist. Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, and every God-fearing, sin-hating preacher after has preached repentance. Amen. Don't give up on repentance. Amen. It's not about praying some little simple prayer, guys. Talking somebody in to be saved. Repentance needs to take place. That was the central message. And he took up the mantle, and the first message he preaches, repent and believe. It's the same message we preach today. His public ministry, he moves it because of persecution. He plants it in Capernaum. He starts preaching right away. And then what does he do next? He finds some men to catch. He goes out, he catches some men first. Yeah. And so what he does was, he picks up exactly where John the Baptist left off. Jesus, in some sense, was a, a product of John the Baptist's ministry in that sense. And now he's continuing on the work John the Baptist started. Jesus is looking to replicate himself in the lives of others so that they too could continue on the work themselves. We know in a parallel passage, if you hold your place here in Matthew, go over to John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. We find again a parallel passage here. John chapter 1. This one actually does give us a little bit more detail. This is after the baptism of Jesus. We start verse 35. You know, if we don't compare Scripture upon Scripture, we may get confused about the, these callings and why did he call them? Well, you know, why didn't he preach the gospel to them? Why didn't he get them saved first before he called them? Well, why do we assume he didn't? Amen. Scripture reveals it for us. John 1.35 says, Again, the next day after John stood, two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, saying, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So they were disciples of John's, true believers, by the way. They believed that whom he was preaching. Because he said, remember, there's one coming after me that I'm not even worthy to latch us to shoot. He was pointing people to Jesus. And then when Jesus came, they started following Jesus. And that's what happened. And it says, uh, and then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith to them, come and see. Don't you love that about Jesus? He's so inviting. Come and see. You want to see for yourself? Come and see. You can't get saved until you come and see for yourself. People can talk about being saved. People can talk about new life in Christ. But until you come and see and see for yourself, you'll never know what they're talking about. In fact, you'll either leave them uh, behind, you'll, you'll, you'll get away from them, you'll call them crazy, you'll, you'll think they went crazy, they joined a cult, all these things, all the things we hear, that's what you're going to hear. Because they don't understand. Why don't you just come and see for yourself? What are you so scared about? Amen. I don't know what you're scared about. You're scared to see yourself the way God sees you. Amen. You're scared to admit the fact that, that you do deserve to go to hell. That's, right. that's a horrible place, a fearful place to get to. But a hopeful place, when you get to that place, there's only one place to look. When you know you're already in hell, when you know you're going to be there, there's only one place, and that's to look up. Yeah. And to see that cross brings so much hope, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, he, for, for our peace, he endured the cross. So he goes out and he gets these men, and, and, and they say, listen, come, he says, come and see. They come, came and saw where he brought the bow with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon 
and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. When he said the Christ, that means he understood Jesus was God in the flesh. Amen. He understood that. Because Christ is, a, 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 a Emmanuel is Christ with us, God with us. He understood that. He understood that. Now, uh, Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's, a, that's an important title. That's why men, Jesus says, beware when men in the last days are going to come and say, I am Christ. What are they saying? Oh, we, we've been sent from God. We're the, we're the Son of God. We're Jesus Christ again coming back. So you better beware. You know, the next event is, is, is the trumpet that's going to sound. And the Holy Spirit's going to be taken out of this world, 2 Thessalonians 2. And guess what? You've got the Holy Spirit if you're saved. Yeah. So you're going up with the Holy Spirit. You're going, we call that the rapture. That's the next thing to happen. So anybody that comes down and says, Hi, I'm Jesus Christ, follow me. Mark them, stay away from them, call them out. They're liars, they're deceivers, they're antichrists. Right. And so he, he gets Andrew, and Andrew goes home right away, gets Simon, who we know as Peter. He brings him, verse 20, 20, or 42, and he brought him to Jesus. That's a great thing to do, isn't it? Right. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. And now Philip was in Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, and Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. <laughs> Wow, the replication's happening already, amen? amen. That's how it's supposed to happen. He, he went out and he got some men to catch. He, he picks Andrew and Peter. Um, uh, he picks James and John. Uh, he tells them they're fishermen. They're working in the boats. We don't have time to go there. But Luke chapter 5, you'll, you'll find where, remember the ships were in the land and the men were mending their nets. Well, that was James and John and his father. And Peter and Andrew were there. And then some of them were probably cleaning their nets somehow, maybe throwing them out, cleaning them up. And Jesus comes along, goes in Peter's boat, thrusts out a little bit, starts talking, and then says, Peter, go out and uh, launch out. We're going to get you a draft of fish. That great miracle that took place. It's the same time, same place. We just don't have time to go through it all. But we find here that they went out and they were told, follow me. And the Bible says they forsook their nets. Now, those nets were very important to those fishermen. Yeah. It's like telling you today, we don't use too many, uh, so if we go fishing, we don't use nets per se so much anymore. We use fishing poles. Take a fishing pole away from a guy who loves to fish, you know, which is his livelihood, where he eats from, that, that, that he sells up at the market. You take that away from him, man, you're impacting him. You're taking away his nets. That's symbolic of his, of his entire livelihood. Uh, uh, who he is, uh, uh, taking him away from his family, his family business, taking him away from his ambitions. And man, maybe he wanted to branch off from his father. Maybe he wanted to add two more ships, wanted to make a, you know, make his own shipping vessel and his own business. And he had all these ambitions. He had all these dreams. He had all these goals. And in a moment's notice, because he knew Jesus, Jesus said, leave it all behind, guys. And he said, yes, sir. Amen. Wow. What faith. They forsook the net, the fish, the ships, the father, everything. And they followed him. That's important. If you're going to forsake that stuff, you better be following Jesus. Right. And, and they forsook it. They, they forsook and they followed. Mm -hmm. How do you know somebody's following Christ? Well, unlike half the population in this world that thinks there's a dark winter coming. Yeah. You know, the Bible tells me if I follow after Jesus, I shall walk in the light of life yes. and shall not have darkness. You know what I know what's sad? You know how I, oftentimes I preach a lot about, you know, the problems in the churches today? That there's a lot of liberal churches today that support this nonsense going on. I told you I was having a, I had a phone call with the governor on Friday. There was a, 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 a meeting with a bunch of preachers. And uh, it was an online thing and I got to go on there and and uh, you, you want to get your blood boiling, and you sit around with a bunch of preachers who are liberal. I had no idea who was going to be on there. I just wanted to, my, my shot at them. And I didn't get my shot at them because it was a monopoly. Every one of them 
Every one of them thinks this is the darkest time we're going into. They even use the term, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Joe Biden used the term that we're heading into a very dark winter. This, uh, and 200 more thousand people are going to die because of this virus. And he thinks we ought to shut everything down because of it. Called it the dark winter. I sat on a phone call and a preacher said, Governor, we found out last night that we're heading for a very dark winter. So what are we going to do? And I hit the button right away to throw my hand up, and I never got called that. I'm sure I wasn't the only one. But that's what you're dealing with. People who are so consumed with fear, the danger has called them to be cowards, not courageous. I don't know about you, I've just chosen I want to be courageous. I'm not being stupid. I think you got to be prudent, you got to be wise, you don't be foolish. You don't just throw caution to the wind. Are you going to stop your whole life? Just because there's a virus out there? I've had family members that have died from this, or they say have died from this. We've been afflicted with it. Some of uh, in this church have had it already. Another preacher on his phone call suggested that everywhere somebody works that they've had COVID, there should be a sign posted on the door so the person going in should be able to know if COVID's been in that place. This is a preacher! That's what they're, they're bending out like, well, now I know why the governor's doing what he's doing. Yeah. Look who's bending his ear. Yeah. Another one called for, we're not going to be able to handle this statewide. We're going to have to do a national mandate on masks. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, what is going on here? And I felt like I was really got kind of Ezekiel, was it Ezekiel? Scratching in the wall to see what's going on in the moment with the government. I thought, man, this is pathetic. Now I know what's going on. And, uh, and, and I tell you, there's, there, there's, you know who you're following. You know how you know who you're following? If your love is constrained to the Word of God. Paul said, I'm constrained with the love of Christ. Is your love constrained? That means it has boundaries. You work within the boundaries. You stay within the boundaries. You have a, 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 a continual life. You're in fellowship with God. Amen. And you have a content life. That's how you know you're walking with God. That's how you know you're following the right person. Amen. You say, you, you think Peter and them thought about it? I don't know what they thought about, but I know this. They left it all behind and followed Christ when he told them to come and do it. And we need to do that too. Jesus said he would make them fishers of men. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, okay, I know how to fish for fish. What in the world is he talking about? And that would have been my shallow conversation with the Lord. Like, Lord, what are you talking about? We don't have words. We do know in Luke 5, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. They didn't understand what that meant, but they went and did it. Some of you are sitting around, you, you'll never go out door knocking, you'll never tell somebody about Christ, because you think you've got to learn more. You don't got to learn more, you've got to do more. You can't catch a fish unless you put the line in the water. I don't always know how to put the bait on. My kids know that. They're looking at me like I'm supposed to show them something. I don't remember how to do all this stuff. We just throw it in there. Sometimes you just, you go with Brother Star, man, he just go and gets Taco Bell, and he puts it in there, and he catches these huge catfish. I don't know how he does it. But, uh, but man, you, you, you know, they didn't know. You just, if you want to catch the fish, you got to go fishing. You can't sit around and say, oh, I hope somebody gets saved. Oh, I hope we see people come to church. Oh, I hope we see people get saved. And we don't go out and try to win them. we got to go out and do it. The best way to learn is to go out and do it. Follow Christ. Forsake everything from behind. Get your priorities straight and go out and do the work and he'll teach you how to, uh, to, to, to catch men. And then lastly, in the beginning of his ministry, the multitudes were already there. The multitudes came that he needed to cleanse. The Bible says his fame went throughout all of Judea, uh, uh, Galilee. They heard his teaching. They heard his preaching. All the healings that were taking place. By the way, he couldn't really do this in Capernaum. We know later he chews out Capernaum and says... If, if, if the works that were done elsewhere were done here, Chorazin, which is around Capernaum, it says they would have already repented. And he chewed out Capernaum, told Capernaum that they were going to be judged more harshly because they saw these things happen and they didn't believe. So his fame went abroad and his following multiplied. They sought the man who could do the miracles, which would then... Give Jesus the opportunity to preach the gospel and save souls. Do you know why God gives you a new life in Jesus Christ? So that you won't live the old life anymore. 
and somebody that is close to you, somebody that knows you, somebody you work with, somebody in the, in the marketplace, somebody in church, somebody somewhere sees such a difference in your life that when they come to you and you tell them you got saved, they start wanting to know how to get saved. That is the ministry. The disciple gives up his life as a ransom for many. The disciple lets his good works be seen before all men that they may glorify the Father in heaven. The disciple puts off the old man, puts on the new man. The disciple walks in the light. He follows the Spirit. He doesn't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And why? Because he wants to glorify the Lord and he wants to catch men. Amen. You know, how you're handling this quote-unquote pandemic is speaking volumes to the people around you. Yeah. That's right. You're either being a help to them or you're being a hindrance to them. And there's no in between, one or the other. Faith or fear, you make your choice. Yeah. I made mine. I'm going to stay on the faithful side. Yeah. Say, what if you get it? Well, I think we already had it. What if you get it again? I don't know if you can. <laughs> but if I can get it again, God's got a purpose in it. Right. If God takes my life, He's got a purpose in it. And I'm okay with that. Amen. I'm not going to shelter myself because of something going on around us. Where did our faith go? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get out there. People need to know that there's people of faith, strong Bible-believing Christians that are not allowing the government or a virus or a, a pandemic or whatever's going on to stop them yeah. from worshiping God, from living right, from doing the right thing. That's the ministry. The Lord shows us this in the very onset of His public ministry. We see all of the facets of it. Now, why is that important? Because it's our ministry, too. It's our ministry. In our ministry, we need to forsake our nets. God may take our nets away. A lot of people have their nets taken away yeah. by governors, by viruses, by all kinds of things. Um, their nets are taken away. And, 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 and that's a whole different struggle when it gets taken away that way. But we can make the choice willingly, purposefully, cheerfully to say, Lord, I'm going to do it your way. Yeah. I'm going to live, your, I'm gonna live this life that you've given me for you. So... You can use my life to bring others. Remember, Andrew went and found his brother and brought him to Jesus. Philip went and found Nathaniel and brought him to Jesus. Let me finish with this question. Who have you brought to Jesus? Let's pray. Amen. Father, we come to you today. Lord, I thank you for the liberty that the Word of God gives us to be both comforting but also confrontational in our preaching. Because we need both. And Lord, some have been comforted here this morning. Some have been challenged. Some have been convicted. So Lord, I, I pray that whatever decisions that are made today, that they would be made for the purposeful and willingness and cheerfulness of wanting to please you. There may be somebody here who's not even saved. They didn't even know they needed to be saved. But they've realized today that their only hope is to trust Christ as Savior. So we pray for them and we pray, Lord, for every one of us, who, who claim to be believers, who claim to be Christians. Lord, forgive us. Some of us in this room have never brought anybody to Jesus. What a sad testimony that is. But Lord, you tell us for the purpose of inspiring us to go find someone. So help us to do that. Maybe you're putting people on our hearts right now, Lord, that we can pray for. But Lord, be glorified in whatever takes place in this invitation time now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to invite you to come. You come this morning. Listen, if you need to trust Christ as your Savior, if you don't know for sure that you're saved, the Bible says you can know for sure. You can have the knowledge of salvation. Not that you think you're saved or you hope you're saved. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? If not, you can come this morning. We'll show you the Bible. We'll show you. We've already gone over everything that's necessary for you to get saved. 
Are you willing to repent and believe the gospel? God will save you if you are. How about a Christian? How about a believer? When's the last time you brought somebody to meet Jesus? When's the last time you brought somebody to church? When's the last time you brought somebody to your house to explain to Jesus? Or going to them? Said, I'd like to tell you about Jesus. We talk about it often. We believe the Lord's coming soon. Should we not be elevated in our awareness, in our actions, in doing the work of the Lord? Should we not be praying more, preaching more, getting out in the streets more? God help us to do that. beginning of the public ministry. And Lord, you've given us all a public ministry. So help us, Lord, to yearn after it, to go after it, to, to go forward. Lord, all we have to do is forsake and follow. And you'll make us more conscious about the souls of men around us. And Lord, if there be somebody in this room today who still is not saved, Lord, I pray you'll continue to strive with them and help them to think about their own life and, and their own destiny, Lord, their own eternity. And what your promises say about that, and I pray, Lord, before they draw their last breath, whether young or old, that they would have put their faith and trust in you. Thank you, Lord. Bring us back safely tonight, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, earnestly. far and wide.